This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome into the Inspirational Bible Study Ministry. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Blank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. The ministry's mission is to teach the Word of God in order that men and women might have, my, or rather come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is our mission, that is our ministry. That men and women may have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus to Christ. We thank God for this day and we just ask and pray that God will now continue to lead this Bible study through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And with that, brothers and sisters, let's just take a moment, quiet our hearts and minds, and let us prepare for our study for today in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us here this day to come together in fellowship, not only with one another, but with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray now, Father, that you would now just let the Holy Spirit take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to be uh, studying today. It's going to be coming from the uh, first Corinthians chapter four, verses one through six and verses 17 through 21. The title of our study for this morning is the judgment of the kingdom. Our key verse comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, which reads, Judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Amen. Amen, brothers, sisters, amen. Okay, next week we will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. Our historical background. Last week, brothers and sisters, our study took us to the 14th chapter of Romans, where Paul continued to speak about the nature of the kingdom of God, and the behavior of Jew and Gentile Christians concerning eating of meat. Prior to his letter to the Romans, Paul had to deal with certain problems in the churches in Galatia, where he had to address the false teachings of the Judaizers, Judaizers who taught that Gentile Christians, Christian men, should be circumcised along with other Old Testament ceremonial laws. But Paul's mantra was always peace and edification, among other things. As he has said to those in Rome, his words are also applicable today for us, brothers and sisters. He says, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another, which is the act of building up. But with the edifying also came a warning. He says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. It is good neither to eat or nor drink, eat uh, meat nor drink wine, uh, nor do anything which your brothers, your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Now in the first century Jewish culture, culture, Jewish Christians stood out for obvious reasons and apart from the larger Jewish community because of their acceptance of Jesus the Christ and their acceptance of Gentiles who believed in Jesus the Christ. Gentile Christians, for their part, had abandoned the pagan worship that required loyalty to the Roman Empire, if you will. So if these two renegade groups became known for their argument over things such as food, <clears throat> their credibility would greatly suffer. But if they could demonstrate love, their example could shine among the people and even draw others to Christ. 
This was what Paul, this is what Paul may have meant when he said, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. That's love. That's love, brothers and sisters. He's telling them and he's telling us not to allow the simple things. And in the church at Rome, it was food. He says, don't allow the simple things such as food destroy the work of God. Although it may seem trivial, Paul knew that left unchecked, it could hinder the growth of the church in Rome as well as cause divisions, as it sometimes does today in some churches. Condemnation of another brother or sister should never be tolerated, brothers and sisters. The doctrine of Christ, the gospel by which we live by, and the teachings of the apostles should always be rehearsed in our daily walk, being always mindful, brothers and sisters, that we are to never put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in the path of another brother or sister. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God, the scripture says. Speaking to the church at Rome, Paul said, happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves of but he who doubts is condemned if he eats or do anything else contrary to the conscience's conviction because he does it because he does not eat from faith, he says. For whatever is not of faith is sin, according to the scripture. For the child of God, it's all about the conscience. Our study ended with Paul saying that what you and I approve of or do not approve of should always be done in faith, not doubting or putting into question one's conscience. Brothers and sisters, like it or not, we can't escape the voice of our conscience. Left alone, untouched by human influence, our conscience is the closest thing that the closest thing that comes to the divine stamp of God's moral standards ingrained in our psyche. In other words, they are ingrained in our spiritual makeup. It serves as both our moral gatekeeper and an alarm system, if you will, for lack of a better word. It is the aspect of our spirit that compares our behavior to the standards which we claim to profess and notifies us when we fall short of those standards. This is what the apostle wanted the Jew and Gentile Christians to understand. And every believer today should apply these words to their everyday decisions. One of the, th one of the three parts, of the three parts rather, that make up our soul, parts of our soul, will, intellect, and emotions, our conscience has its discussions mostly with the will and the intellect. Today's study takes us to 1 Corinthians where Paul is writing to the believers at Corinth and addressing reports by Chloe's people of dissensions in the church, addressed in a letter received from the believers in, uh, in Corinth, seeking guidance on a variety of issues Paul took this opportunity to also introduce a detailed teaching on the resurrection. Paul wrote the letter while he was at Ephesus during his third missionary journey around AD 55. And to be clear, brothers and sisters, 1 Corinthians, that letter was actually the second letter Paul had written to the believers in Corinth. The first letter was lost. Leading up to our study, we find in chapter three, Paul's warning to the church concerning their spiritual immaturity. And though they were believers in Christ, they were babes, still allowing their carnal nature to become a source of divisiveness and destruction within the church where they began taking sides concerning the greatness of Paul 
or Apollos or even Cephas, Peter. So do we have this problem in churches today? Yes, yes we do. We do well to understand that in the church, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. For we are mere unworthy servants of the Lord. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. So I encourage you, friends, to read Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Our Lord's commission makes disciples, it was to make disciples of all nations. This starts by doing what? Spreading the gospel to peoples of the world. Matthew 24, 14 writes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then what? And then the end will come. But we are reminded that only God can give the increase. We are not to focus on how many we, uh, how many have received Christ through the preaching or the teaching of the word of God, or but rather how many have heard the gospel. Only God gives the increase, friends. I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to read carefully 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. For in these verses, many believers will be convicted of their work for Christ or lack thereof, and their reward in heaven or lack thereof. And so this takes us to our study for today. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we find where it says, Paul says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, he says, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. One be found faithful. The correctional words of Paul in chapter 3 are followed by saying to the believers at Corinth that this then is how you ought to regard us. He's speaking of himself, Apollos, or it's even Cephas, uh, Cephas, who was Peter. He says, this is how you are to regard us as servants of Christ and as stewards entrusted and faithful concerning the mysteries, which are the hidden purpose, uh, hidden purposes and counsel God has revealed. Paul uses his, his pen as a rod of correction to discipline the wayward Corinthian believers for a variety of ills, brothers and sisters, to include immorality. So in chapter 4, he reasserts his apostolic authority as someone who has been given divine trust. Having received his apostolic commission from the Lord Jesus himself, according to Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 9. It doesn't matter, brothers and sisters, whether we serve full-time in Christian ministry or not. The fact that you and I have believed in Christ as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, for our sins, makes you and I steward over a sphere of influence in someone's life. Our lives, therefore, must be lived as full-time servants of Jesus the Christ and not a part-time Christian. You can't be a part-time Christian, brothers and sisters. It's all or none. Our call to operate under the authority of Christ Jesus requires that we be faithful to the Savior's call and commission which is to spread the gospel whenever the opportunity arises. We are to do what? We are to drop the seed, brothers and sisters, that it may grow and lead a soul to Christ Jesus. Verses three through five, Paul says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. 
In fact, I do not even judge myself, he says. For I know of nothing, I know of nothing against myself, yet I, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, Paul says, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. Who will do what? Who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel, the counsels, counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Each one's praise, he says, will come from God. And so Paul was seen by many in Corinth as in an unfavorable manner. Although they considered his letters to, to them to be weighty and forceful, he says, they didn't regard him as an affluent public speaker. They viewed his physical appearance as, quote unquote, unimpressive. The apostle recognized that he was being wrongly judged, however, but despite what they thought of him, it says, Paul was a faithful steward. How many of us can make that claim, brothers and sisters? How many of us can say that we are a faithful steward? Paul goes on to, to explain to the church at current. He says that I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court, which literally means human day in contrast to the Lord's day of judgment. Indeed, he says, I do not even judge myself. He says that it is the Lord who judges me. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent, he says. So Paul admonishes those who would judge him by saying, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. Let Christ be judged, be the judge, not man. That's what Paul is saying. And then he says, let praise come from God. For all of humanity will one day do what? They will one day be assembled before the God of creation in judgment when Christ our Savior returns. All will hear and know the rightness of his judgment according to Psalm 9:8 according to Acts 17, 31. As Paul entrusted himself entirely to God's judgment and evaluation of him, so likewise, we ought to do the same, brothers and sisters. We should not pass judgment upon other people's actions, how one might look, etc., but wait until the Lord returns. When Paul speaks of things hidden in darkness, the term has an ethical significance as things morally bad or things either bad or good of which a person may be ignorant. Nonetheless, in Christ Jesus, praise from God carries with it an undoubted uh, connection with either the wages or the rewards according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 14. He says, For we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in thy body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. But to be clear, brothers and sisters, Paul still held a position of authority in relation to the church at Corinth. After all, he was the one who established it. And in reference to those who will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, only the saved will, be, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And they are to be judged based on the things, or rather be rewarded, based on the things that they have done or not, think, or not done. So 
those who stand before Christ Jesus are not standing for a condemnation and judgment in terms of a final judgment um, of, uh, of things that they have done in terms of evil and in terms of sin, because Jesus has already taken our sins upon himself. You see, we will be judged for the things that we did for the gospel, for Christ, when we stand before him. And so in verse six, Paul says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. One, he says, against the other. And so the NIV version says it a little more plainly. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over the other. In other words, Paul is saying two things here. The most important being everything Christ's servant think, says, and do is to be rooted in and derived from God's authoritative inerrant word, which is the Bible. Secondly, the church is not to look to nor risk being puffed up, if you will, on behalf of a particular person. And in the case of, of, of our study for today, it would be Paul or Paul or Peter pitting one against another. But to the words of the Savior only, do not go beyond or exceed what is written in the context of today's study, may refer to those in Corinth who were exceeding their proper bounds as Christians, either through arrogance or by boasting about their particular favorite teacher, or even bragging about their own spiritual or physical accomplishments, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So think about this, friends. The sin of pride was subtly spreading among the believers in Corinth, as evidenced by its divisiveness over people, positions, and gifts. When a church begins choosing one particular member over another, or begins to believe one spiritual gift to be superior to another, or, condesc or condescending regarding one's position in the church, Pride has crept into that church. But if a, con a congregation understands that it is forbidden to judge one person over another, if they understand that all gifts come from the Holy Spirit and are given to every believer as the Spirit sees fit, and if a church assigns members of the congregation to various positions in the church based on their gifts and not their influence, that church will be blessed, it will prosper, and will more easily concede that all judgment is forbidden according to the word of God. Jesus says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. He says, forgive and you will be forgiven. All believers, all believers, brothers and sisters, fall under the sovereign authority and rule of Jesus the Christ. In First Tim, in First Corinthians, chapter four, verse nine, uh, seventeen, Paul says, "For this reason, I have sent to you, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved." and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. 
Brother Paul could not be at Corinth to set things in order and personally answer questions the church needed answering. So he does what? So he wrote letters which were substitutes for his personal presence. He would entrust these letters to faithful associates who could listen, observe, explain, and encourage the believers. Then they would report back to Paul. In his letters to the Corinthians, his letter to the Corinthians, Paul would send his beloved disciple, uh, Timothy, to deliver this letter to the church at Corinth. Now, there are two views on how Paul's letter might have been delivered to the churches. One view is that Timothy personally took the letter to the church. The other view is that the letter could have been sent ahead of Timothy, who came shortly afterwards. I tend to lean towards the first view, friends. Paul's teachings throughout his missionary journeys were always consistent. He understood his calling and he answered it, enduring the suffering that came with it, came along with it. And this should give us cause to pause for a moment, brothers and sisters, and consider whether or not we understand our own calling and have likewise answered it. Do we understand that we are to expect persecutions and sufferings because of evil forces which wages which wage war against our faith, against our obedience, and, and against Christ's church? And if so, like Paul, we do and do we do the will of the Father, use the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Continue to spread the gospel. In other words, brothers and sisters, like Paul, we too have the Holy Spirit. We too have a calling. We too have been given gifts. Therefore, we should use all to the glory of God and the spreading of the gospel. This is the call of the church, and in particular, the believer's duty and commission. In verses 21, 18 through 21, Paul says, Now some of you are puffed up, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord's will, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod? or in love and a spirit of gentleness. And so the apostle knew that his letter being delivered by Timothy would run the risk of endangering or engendering rather feelings of animosity from some of those who had now become puffed up in the church. They had become arrogant which had also began to permeate throughout the church. Not having the oratory skills of Apollos, they perceived Paul as being timid and unimpressive. Um, we find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and verse 10. And they basically were saying that for these reasons, Paul would not return, giving them free reign to do what? To do as they please, and supposed that Timothy's arrival indicated Paul's fear to come himself. Because of this, Paul warns that if it's God's will, he says, he will return and will find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power, you see. In other words, brothers and sisters, Paul would find out the substance behind the style. That's what he's talking about. Where was their spiritual authority? The scriptures identify Paul as being handpicked by the Lord himself, called to be an apostle. 
Paul said in his letter to the uh, in his letter that he says that the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. We see in Christ Jesus that when the king, Christ the king, arrived, so also his kingdom, which was characterized by spiritual power. In the Greek is called dynamis, spiritual power and authority. Christ came. And so in Christ coming, demonstrating his power through his signs and miracles, and not merely through the speaking or the preaching of the gospel. Our Lord preached the gospel of salvation. He preached the gospel of repentance and the forgiveness of sin. His words were followed by demonstrated power seen in miracles and signs and authority over demons and authority over nature itself. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 writes that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. John 1.1 1, 1 goes even further and says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That word became flesh, who was Jesus the Christ. When Christ chose his apostles to later include Saul of Tarsus, their responsibility and commission was to continue what the Savior started. In other words, and in order to do this, Christ through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, endowed them with the power to preach and to heal and to teach and to even cast out demons. Did these arrogant men who were challenging Paul's authority in Corinth have this same power? No, no, they did not. Were they chosen by God? No, they were not. The Apostle Paul ends by giving these individuals a choice, saying this, what do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, in other words, to chasten, to chastise and correct you, or in love and a spirit of gentleness? And so we know, we know, brothers and sisters, as we end our study for today, we know that, that Paul did intend to return to Corinth. We know this according to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. How the apostle did himself return to Corinth. And so with that, it ends our study for today. I pray that this has been a blessing. And with that, let us close in prayer, brothers and sisters. O oh, Heavenly Father, your word is truth. And your word is given to us to understand, to believe, to trust. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives us an understanding of your word. We thank you, Father, for blessing us to hear your word to be able to hear and to study and to spread your word. For many are not able to do this. We thank you, Father, and we give you the praise and the glory that only you deserve, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, have a wonderful and blessed day. Amen.